In last two lectures, we have been dealing with motion along a straight line. Today, we take motion in a plane. What is the difference? Along a straight line, you need not distinguish between velocity and speed. In a plane, however, this is not possible. Velocity and speed are now two different physical quantities. In a plane, what we do is, we take velocity in whatever direction it is and break it up into two components, one along the x axis and the other along the perpendicular y axis. The components are V x equal to V cos theta and V y is equal to V sin theta. And we study the motion along these two components independently and then later on superimpose to find out the actual motion of the body. So, as an example, we take a building which is 125 meters high. From the top of that building, we launch an object horizontally with a velocity of 10 meters per second. Now, in the horizontal direction, there is no other force. Therefore, the object would move 10 meters in 1 second, 20 meters in 2 second and so on. However, in the vertical direction, there is the force of gravity and therefore, the, the distance covered in the vertical direction would be given by y equal to half g t square. So, we after each second, we note the position along the x axis and the position along the y axis from the top of the building and we assemble the data in this table. Here you see horizontal axis, the distance is 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 seconds. On the vertical axis, the distance from the top is 0, 5, 20, 45, 80, 125 meters and we plot this along the x and y axis and we find that the curve has this shape. What is this shape? This shape is called a parabola. A curve of this shape is called a parabola. Let me give you a few examples of this curve, the parabola. You see, you have a water tube and the water will come out of this, let us say. The path that this water describes is a parabola. When a batsman hits a cricket ball, I mean cricket must be your favorite game. When a batsman hits a ball, then the ball that has a trajectory or a path which is parabolic. An athlete attempting a long jump launches herself into a path of this shape as shown here. If you have been to a seaside, you must have seen dolphins jumping out of water and going back into water. I will show you here. This is a dolphin coming out of water, jumps up, comes down into the water and the, what is the path? The path followed by this dolphin is a parabola. So, we have now enough recognition of parabola. So, let us see how we can now describe the motion of an object which is launched at an angle to the horizontal from the ground. Just like a batsman hits a ball and then let us see what kind of path it would follow. As before, we have got the components of velocity v cos theta along the x axis, v sin theta along the y axis and study the motion independently and then we superimpose one above the other. The motion along the x axis is independent of any force. So, therefore, the distance covered in time t along the x axis is v cos theta times t, no force is acting. In the y direction, there is the force of gravity and therefore, the distance covered in the vertical direction is the vertical velocity v sin theta into t minus half g t square, where g is the acceleration due to gravity. To get the equation of the path in the x y plane, we need to eliminate t from these t two equations. So, we eliminate t and we get the equation y equal to x times tan theta minus half g x squared divided by v squared cos squared theta. This equation is of the form y equal to a x plus b x square, which you recognize from geometry is the equation of a parabola.
I show you here the path followed by this body which is launched at an angle to the horizontal. Such a body is called a projectile. So, this path is that of a projectile. Sometimes this path itself is known as projectile, but the projectile is the body which is launched. And you can see here I have got in red color the velocity v, then I have got components v x, v y. V x you can see stays constant, you can see the length of V x stays the same. V y velocity along the vertical direction of course, decreases because of the acceleration due to gravity bring, trying to bring it back and at the top of the journey V y becomes 0, then it starts falling back and comes back to the earth, comes back to the ground and you can see the velocity V again can be broken up into components v x v y, v x is the same and v y is also the same because of conservation of energy. So, this is the path followed by a projectile, this is the path followed by a ball hit by a batsman. Vertically upward velocity is v y equal to v sin theta, the highest point reached is v sin theta square by 2 g, at the highest point the upward velocity is 0. But there is a downward acceleration equal to g. The horizontal velocity at this point is constant as I showed you in the last slide. The time taken by the projectile to reach the highest point of this trajectory is t equal to v sin theta by g. In this time the projectile has travelled a distance horizontally a distance t into v cos theta and if we substitute the values we will get this distance which is called the range of the projectile, this is equal to v squared sin 2 theta by 2 g. And you can see that if I if theta is 45 degrees, the range is the maximum. I will show you in this slide. I have drawn graphs for projectiles which are launched at an angle of 30 degrees, at an angle of 45 degrees, at an angle of 60 degrees. And you can see that the projectile at an angle of 45 degrees has the maximum range. So, here I have collected the all the facts about the projectile. The horizontal velocity is v cos theta and distance covered is v cos theta into t, horizontal velocity is v sin theta and the distance covered is v sin theta into t minus r g t square. We eliminate t from these two equations and we get y equal to tan x into tan theta into x minus half g x squared by v squared cos squared theta. This is the equation of parabola. The highest point reached by the projectile is v sin theta square by 2 g and the range the maximum horizontal distance covered by the projectile is v square sin 2 theta by 2 g. Let us take one or two examples to fix the ideas about this projectile. Let us take take this example. You see this is a very familiar example. A helicopter on a rescue mission, you know when there are floods, the government orders helicopters to drop food packets on people who are marooned. So, here we have an example of a boat which is marooned in, in, in a river or somewhere and, and we have a helicopter which is going to drop the food packets on the boat. So, a helicopter on a rescue mission spots a boat at a horizontal distance of 40 meters. The helicopter finds that there is a boat at a distance of 40 meters from it. If the helicopter is at a height of 20 meters and is moving with a horizontal speed of 10 meters per second, at what horizontal distance from the boat should it release the food packet so that it hits the boat. You see the, the food packet as you uh, recall would have the horizontal velocity of the helicopter. So, the food packet starts with a velocity of uh, 10 meters per second. So, remember this and we are going to take g equal to 10 meters per second square for the simplicity of calculations. So, let us solve this problem for the helicopter pilot, so that he does not make a mistake. First, we must find the time taken for the food packet to fall the vertical distance of 20 meters. This is given by h equal to half g t square. So, 
plugging the numbers, we get t equal to 2 seconds. So, it will take the food packet to travel a distance of 20 meters along the vertical direction would be 2 seconds. We want that the helicopter should release this packet such that in 2 seconds it covers a horizontal distance also of 20 meters, so that it falls in the boat itself. Let me remind you, show you once again the problem. Here is a helicopter, helicopter must release the packet here, so that it travels along a parabola and then falls on the boat. It does not miss the boat, it does not fall before the boat or after the boat. So, it will take 2 seconds and in 2 seconds the packet needs to travel a distance of 20 meters. So, if the helicopter releases here, what will happen? The packet would fall here. If the helicopter releases here, then the superposition of the vertical motion and the horizontal motion would be such that the packet falls in the boat itself. This is very important for the pilot of the helicopter to know. Let us take another example. All of you are familiar with Virat Kohli. I know most of the students have Virat Kohli as one of their icons. He hits a ball at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal. Not that he always does that, but as an example, we can take the 45 degrees to the horizontal. The ball lands at a distance of 80 meters from his position. That is from the pitch, the ball lands at a distance of 80 meters. Assuming g equal to 10 meters per second square, find the time for which the ball was in air and how high it went. You see, that is also important for the fielder because the fielder must know where the ball is likely to fall so that if he is there, he to catch the ball. So, let us plug in the numbers again and the we know that the range is equal to v squared sin 2 theta by 2 g and everything is given, angle is given, g is given. So, we can find the range is given, so we can find out v and it turns out that v is 40 by root 2 meters per second. That is the velocity with which the ball is launched. With this velocity, the time taken by the ball to reach the highest point of its journey is u by g and that time is 4 by root 2 seconds. 4 by root 2 seconds to come down also. So, the total time would be twice into 4 by root 2. Then we get the ball in the air therefore, stays for 4 times root 2. And the vertical distance travelled again you can find from half g t square and that is equal to 40 meters. Let us take another example. This one is from the police. You see a bullet is fired towards an object which is at the same height as the gun. If the distance of the object is 100 meters and the speed of the bullet is 100 meters per second, at what angle to the horizontal should the gun be pointed so that the bullet hits the target? We take g once again as 10 meters per second square. You see, if the gun is kept horizontal and the shot is fired, because of the acceleration due to gravity, it will never hit the target. Similarly, if you make the angle larger, again the, the uh, bullet will go up and may not hit the object. So, this angle has to be very carefully calculated by the person who is going to shoot the bullet from the gun and therefore, we have taken this problem. You see, this can also happen. Um, suppose the army is uh, launching a missile on an enemy to destroy the enemy uh, guns or enemy uh, airports or whatever. If the army does not do it correctly, what will happen? Instead of hitting the target that the army wanted, the missile would hit innocent people either uh, before the target or after the target. So, this targeting is very uh, essential and you need the knowledge of parabola, you need the knowledge of a projectile motion and this angle theta therefore, is very critical. So, let us see how we calculate this angle. It is obvious that if the bullet is fired horizontally like this, because of the attraction of the earth, it will take this path and therefore, if the target is here, it will not hit it. So, we must point it at an angle as I explained to you earlier 
at an angle so that the path taken like this hits the target. So it will it will hit a point lower than the object if it is fired horizontally. If the bullet is fired at an elevation of theta to the horizontal, the vertical component of its velocity would be v y equal to 100 sin theta meters per second and the horizontal component will be v x equal to 100 cos theta meters per second. Now we know how far the target is. So we know the range with this velocity we find the range and then we will fit in with the equation to find theta. So let us go step by step. Now the time taken by the bullet to reach its highest point is v y by g it takes the same time to come down. So the time taken is 2 t which is 2 y v y by g and in that time the distance covered horizontally would be 2 t times v x which is the range we have found earlier and therefore we get the equation 2 into 100 sin theta into 100 cos theta divided by 10 which is g equal to 100 from this we find what the angle theta would be. We find the theta would be in this case 2.85 degrees. But as I have been explaining it is very important that we have the correct calculation of the angle otherwise we will not hit the target and as I said earlier it is very important for the army to launch their missiles such that they hit the place with which they want to and not kill the innocent people. In the next lecture we shall continue with the motion in a plane and study circular motion. Circular motion is another important concept and we shall find that when a body moves in a circular orbit it experiences a force pulling it towards the center of the orbit. This is the last lecture on vectors. Therefore, I wish to take this opportunity to repeat what you have done earlier. We have seen vectors are quantities which have magnitude and direction. We have seen how a vector is drawn by a line segment with an arrowhead. We have seen how a vector has written say vector A with an arrow on it. We also saw that if two vectors have the same magnitude and are in the same direction they are equal. We also saw how we can add two vectors and get the resultant. How one vector can be subtracted from the other vector. How we can get the magnitude of the resultant and its direction using the parallelogram law of addition of vectors. Then we saw how vectors can be multiplied. We have dot product A dot B which gives us the result A B cos theta where A is the magnitude of A, B is the magnitude of B and the product is A B cos theta. Then we saw the multiplication of two vectors result of which was another vector. This is called vector product and we write this as vector C is equal to vector A cross vector B and the magnitude of the product vector C is A B sin theta where theta is the inner angle between the two vectors. We also learned that the product of two vectors can be another vector. This is called cross product. Cross product of vector A and vector B is vector C given by we write it as vector C is equal to vector A crossed vector B and the magnitude of this vector C is A B sin theta where A is the magnitude of A, B is the magnitude of B and theta is the angle between them. And the direction is given by the right hand screw rule or the, the other rule in which you curl your fingers and the direction of the thumb gives the direction of the result the product vector. Now the last thing that we have to do is the resolution of vectors. You are given a vector A 
in this diagram and we want to find out its components along a set of axes in this case axes x and y. How do you find that? You draw perpendiculars from the tip of the vector onto the x axis and onto the y axis. Then simple trigonometry tells us that vector that the component a x is equal to a cos theta and component a y is equal to a sin theta. It is not necessary that they are as shown in the last diagram they can be tilted as in this diagram and we still can find components of vector a is the same vector a along the axes capital X and capital Y. Once again the same thing the angle between them is phi and therefore a x is a cos phi and the component along the y axis is a y which is equal to a sin phi. And from these two slides you must note that the components are not always equal components along one set of axes may not be equal to the components along another set of axes. Why do you find components? Let me remind you that when you derive the expression for the time period of a simple pendulum, then you have to resolve the vertical downwards vector g into components. One component goes this way which cancels the tension in the string and the other component gives us the force which moves the bob and uh, oscillations take place. Therefore, resolution is an important concept and therefore, we are trying to explain it to you. And when we take the components of a vector along a set of axes, this process is called resolution of the vector. Now, let us reverse the process. Suppose we are given a x and a y, then how do you find a vector a? Again, simple geometry tells you that the magnitude of vector a is equal to the square root of a x square plus a y square, whatever sector of x is you take. And the direction is given by for the upper diagram tan theta as the ratio between a y and a x and for the lower diagram tan phi is equal to a y by a x. So, given components you can get the vector itself, its magnitude and direction. We introduce now the concept of unit vectors. As the name suggests, a unit vector has magnitude 1 and has a specified direction. It has no units and no dimensions. As an example, we can write vector a as a which is the magnitude of a times n cap where n cap denotes a unit vector in the direction of vector a. Notice that a unit vector has been introduced to take care of the direction of the vector. The magnitude has been taken care of by a. As an example, we define a unit vector r cap as a unit vector along the line joining two masses m1 and m2. Then we can write the gravitational force between these two masses as the force F g equal to minus g times m1 into m2 by r squared into r cap. You remember I hope that I told you when we were doing the dimensional analysis that the two sides of an equation must always have the same dimensions. Now, you add another thing if the equation is a vector equation then the two sides must be vectors as in this case we have made the right hand side a vector by multiplying it by r cap. And since the force say if I keep m 1 fixed m 2 will be attracted towards m 1. Therefore, the force is in the direction opposite to r cap and therefore, this minus sign here in this formula. Electrostatic force between two charges can also be written in a similar fashion. Of particular importance are the unit vectors along coordinate axes. 
unit vector along x axis is denoted by i cap along y axis by j cap and along z axis by k cap. Using this notation vector a whose components along x y are respectively a x and a y can be written as vector a equal to a x times i cap plus a y times j cap. This is how we write vectors now in terms of the unit vectors. Another vector b can similarly be written as vector b equal to b x, b x is the component along the x axis. So, b x into i cap plus b y into j cap and the sum of these two vectors we write as vector a plus vector b is equal to a x plus b x whole multiplied by i cap. So, it is a y plus b y times j cap. By the rules of scalar product you can show that the dot product of i cap with i cap is just equal to 1 because it is 1 into 1 into cosine theta and the angle theta between them 0 degrees therefore, cosine of 0 is 1 i cap dot i cap is 1 j cap dot j cap is 1 k cap dot, dot k cap is 1. On the other hand if I take i cap dot j cap then it is equal to 0 because the angle now between them is theta is 90 degrees and cosine of 90 degrees is 0. Therefore, i cap dot j cap is 0, j cap dot k cap is 0 and k cap dot i cap is equal to 0. And the dot product between two vectors a and b can be written as vector a dot vector b is equal to again we write them into their components a x i cap plus a y j cap into b x i cap plus b y j cap and we can multiply using these that i cap dot i cap is equal to 1 etcetera. We can get the result a x plus b x plus a y b y. Since this is a scalar a dot b is a scalar only the we get the product there is no vector on this side it is a x b x the component of a multiplied by the component of b along the x axis then the component of a and the component of b along y axis. This is the dot product a dot b. Now, let us take an example I am showing you here a graph in which there is a vector c and the coordinates of vector c are, in are 4 and 5 and therefore, we write this as 4 times i cap plus 5 times j cap and what is the magnitude of c use Pythagoras theorem easy it is a square root of 4 square plus 5 square which is a square root of 41 and the angle theta which it makes with the x axis 10 theta is 5 by 4 or theta is 10 inverse 5 by 4. Take another example vector d in the same diagram and this d is 6 i cap plus 3 j cap and you can have the product c vector dot d vector and use the rules that I have stated earlier and you will see that it is the square root of 39. Similarly, a dot p you can take a dot b in this diagram this is for your exercise and you can see that a dot b is equal to 0. Why is it equal to 0 in this case? In this diagram we see the vectors a and b are at right angles. When the vectors are at right angles you remember that the angle between them is 90 degrees and cosine of theta is equal to 0 and therefore, in this case a dot b is equal to 0. The cross product of two vectors can also be written in terms of the unit vectors. For this we first need the cross product of unit vectors themselves. For this remember that the angle between unit vectors is right angle that is angle between i cap and j cap is right angle angle between j cap and k cap is also right angle. And if we remember this then i cap cross j cap you can easily get is equal to k cap. Why? Because the angle between them is 90 degrees and the product has to be perpendicular to both i and j and that is the z direction and the unit vector in the z direction is k cap. Therefore, i cap cross j cap is equal to k cap and you can use similar logic to get j cap cross i cap 
is equal to minus k cap j cross k cap is equal to i cap k cap cross i cap is equal to j cap and i cap cross k cap is equal to minus j remember this if i j and k are in the same order a i j k or j k i or k i j as long as they are in this order the sign is plus if this order is broken then the sign is minus look at this j cross i is minus k but j cross k is i because j k and i are in the same order so when the order is broken a minus sign is there and i cross i i cap cross i cap is equal to zero because the angle between them is zero and sign of that angle is equal to zero so i cap cross i cap is zero j cap cross j cap is equal to zero k cap cross k cap is equal to zero i cross i cap cross j cap is equal to k cap and like that so let us see how we can write the cross product now the cross product c is equal to ax i cap plus ay j cap cross multiplied by bx i cap plus by j cap and now you use the rules which uh, i have stated just now and therefore you can see that vector c would be equal to ax by minus ay bx into k cap why k cap because we know that vector a and b are in the xy plane therefore cross product has to be in the z direction therefore vector c is ax by minus ay bx times k cap where ax is the x component of a by is the y component of b ay is the y component of a and bx is the x component of b so the cross product of two vectors a and b where a and b are both in the xy plane the cross product as it should comes out to be in the z direction so vector c is you can see in the direction of k cap this result reinforces the fact that the cross product of two vectors in the xy plane is a vector along the z axis please remember this if the vectors are in the xy plane then their cross product product has to be in the z direction either this way or that way since this is going to be used by you very often this is a very important concept so let me repeat this the cross product of two vectors a which is equal to ax i cap plus ay j cap and b vector which is equal to bx times i cap plus by times j cap their product is c and if you use the rule of products uh, between the unit vectors you must get it along the k direction because ax a and b are in the xy plane therefore their product has to be in the direction of z and given the value of the components you can find the magnitude of c let's take another example here we have got in this diagram vector e and f and vector e is minus 5 times i cap minus 3 times j cap and f is minus 3 times i cap plus 3 times j cap and the vector g the product vector is perpendicular to both e and f and e and f are in the xy plane therefore vector g has to be perpendicular to this plane that is in the z direction and you can find that vector g is given by ex fy minus ey fx times k cap and if you use the the values of ex ey fy fx etc then you can get this minus 24 times k cap that means now it is in the minus z direction and you can work out by the rule that i have told you already the right hand screw rule that e cross f would be in the minus z direction so the point is that cross product is such a useful quantity as i have told you earlier there are many things like angular momentum torque lorentz force where we use uh, vector product and vector product is a very important concept 
and many times we have to write the vector product in terms of the unit vectors and therefore please get familiar with unit vectors work with them do exercises where from wherever you can get i have given a few exercises here and remember this concept let's take an example to understand once again the cross product between two vectors here we have taken uh, vectors e and f you can see in the diagram and you can see that vector e is minus 5 times i cap minus 3 times j cap and f vector is equal to minus 3 times i cap plus 3 times j cap now if we use the rules of multiplication of unit vectors as we have done earlier then you would get vector g equal to vector e cross vector f e x f y minus e y f x times k cap and if we use the magnitudes e x e y f x f y then you should be able to get that vector g is equal to minus 24 times cap k that is the vector g is along the minus z direction and you can see from this figure that if you multiply e with f and use the right hand screw rule you should get a vector which is perpendicular to this plane but in the negative z direction and i have repeated this many times because i feel that vector product is an important concept used very often in physics as in angular momentum as in torque as in lorentz force we have to use it very often and therefore i have repeated it so many times for your benefit so that in future you never have problem in understanding the cross product let me repeat the last time the cross product of two vectors is perpendicular to both the vectors and the direction of the vector is given by the right hand screw rule if you remember this and if you can imagine a screw then you can find out the direction of the product vector